Joining me this week for the panel are the president of the American Atheist, David Silverman, and comedian and actor Paul Provenza. Both are godless heathens, so I'm looking forward to sitting down with you two godless people. How did you get here with your <laughs> godless lives? How did, you even, how did you do it? How did you get here today? We did it without gods. You did it without gods? Yeah. You got here, you got in a car, we, and you got here. We did everything without gods. Isn't yeah. that amazing? And by the way, everybody's godless. There, there are no gods, so everybody's godless. I'm just aware of it. So you're just laying it out right, right. at the start. There are no gods. There are no gods. Everybody is godless. Every single person. Everyone is godless. Do you have an opening that can possibly match? I, <laughs> I, I, am, I really just, I'm like the guy that follows the king around with the bucket. With the, <laughs> that's what I am relative to You're the to piss Dave. boy. Oh, so <laughs> would you say uh, that David is the Jesus of the eight? <laughs> is that what you're saying? No, he's a lot older than 33. <laughs> a, there yeah. you go. Um, Not that uh, much older. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk to you guys mm. about. And we've done a bunch of atheist stuff here, and I've had a lot of well-known atheists, but I always feel like there's more to unpack when it comes to atheism. It's sort of endless. Uh, so let's start just simply, and I'll, I'll go to you first on this one. Just give me your, what, what your definition of atheism is, because I always find just even a couple changes of words make it very different to different people. That's that's a really good point, and uh, I, I try to clarify this to people who are under the impression, usually uh, n with negative connotations, that you know, oh, atheists think they know there's no God, but really, I I really subscribe to the, the the parsing of that, which is that that's not the case. What it is is that it is unreasonable for me to believe that there is a God. That reason tells me that there is no God. It's kind of like UFOs. If a UFO came and landed in my, you know, in my backyard, I'd, I'd be the, the first one to say, you're not going to believe it. There's aliens. They just came in from outer space. If there were any evidence, if there were anything that would allow my reason to believe that there were a higher power, then I would certainly consider it. But there is no reason. Right. Okay. So I like that definition, and that's basically what I laid out, that this is basically a lack of belief until someone was to present evidence otherwise, and right. then you would reevaluate. Right. right. When, now, I mean, when atheists say there's no God, that's really just a, it's just a drive-by. It's just a shorthand. There is no God, not saying that they have proof that there is no God, because right. you can't prove a negative, right. but they're saying, I don't believe there's a God. So isn't that a strange way to start this conversation? Because I think there's a feeling, if you were to talk about atheists, people will pick out the big ones, you know, Bill Maher, Richard Dawkins, and they'll say they're, they're so egotistical, they think everything's about them. And I find that to be the reverse of what I know about most atheists, that most atheists sort of stand in awe of everything, but let's, let's get your definition first. You, well, you, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, if, if you think about the theists who think they talk to the creator of the universe, <laughs> and they have a personal <laughs> relationship. Right. There were a trillion, trillion stars in the universe, and the guy who did that knows you. And he thinks you're special and he loves you. I mean, that's really the height of hubris. Yeah. The atheism is simply atheism. It's without the belief in a god. And a god is defined as a supernatural intelligence, okay? We're not talking about people who say, well, I believe God is the universe and God is love. Those are atheists, mm -hmm. okay? If you don't think there is a supernatural intelligence, you're an atheist. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily know the entire universe. It doesn't mean you've studied everything. It means you don't have a belief in a God. Yeah. Now, if you don't have a belief in a God and you don't know the rest of the universe, you're an atheist. And if you don't have a belief in a God and you like some of the secular trappings of your parents' religion, you're an atheist. And if you don't have a belief in a God and you absolutely hate the word atheist, tough shit, you're still an atheist. <laughs> and, and, right. and, and this is something that we really need to get a hold of in this country because, uh, like I told you, in Fighting God, I put together, um, I crunched some numbers, and I came up with a number, a defensible number, that the United States is 27% atheist today. But the polls say we're 2.5%, which means 90% of Americans' atheists don't call themselves atheists. So basically, you come to that number because you'd say that a certain amount of people who say, oh, I'm Jewish, or oh, I'm Christian, right. or whatever, that they actually don't believe, but there's more of a cultural thing that they have that or makes them still associate with it. Or, or a stigma, or a social tie, or one other responsibility or another. I mean, uh, Barna 2009 said 22% of people who call themselves Christians thought God was a metaphor for the universe or love. Those are atheists. <laughs> 
okay? That's not believing in God, that's pretending to believe in a God. Right. Okay? So did you guys try to have the leap of faith? Because I know that I did, for sure. There was a time oh. in college when I was smoking a lot of pot. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, been, <laughs> I've been to Egypt. I've hiked Mount Sinai. That's supposedly where Moses got the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. you know, well, I was, um, I was raised Catholic, and I went to Catholic school for my early elementary school. And uh, my family uh, was uh, Italian immigrants, largely. Uh, uh, and um, Provenza? Italian? I can't hard believe. Hard to believe. <laughs> I know. Shot. Uh, um, so, you know, Catholicism was a big part of my, of, of my growing up, and um, I did allow myself to find some solace in the, um, in the exercise of that, but as I grew older and I, I began to sort of parse down what everything was, what it really was, was uh, just, uh, I was actually transforming all of this into a narrative that made sense for me as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And it was very easy to say, well, I don't believe that. But I also was, you know, uh, my father was a chemist, uh, um, industrial chemist. So he, he had a, uh, he was a scientist basically. My mother was a school teacher. Uh, there was a lot of science in the household. There was a lot of a lot of uh, emphasis on education. I went to the Bronx High School of Science, and uh, but a lot of time that means nothing, right? Because don't you think a lot of times there are people who can be a physicist during the day and ask for empirical evidence all the time, or someone that can be a teacher and want evidence and thought and all that, and then at the same time they can still believe in fairy tales. I suppose that's true, but it wasn't for me. Yeah. yeah. So it was very easy for me to. Uh, I mean, for a long time. I was sort of living with it as metaphor and not realizing that it, that was kind of that was kind of crucial yeah. that I didn't actually believe. But uh, again, as as David says, you know, you're you're <laughs> my friend Glenn Wool says something like, uh, you know, I, uh, I I'm I'm Catholic, but. Well, really, what it is is my parents are Catholic. They picked a religion for me, and now I'm it. Right. right. You know, uh, um, that's really what happens. Um, you were coincidentally born into the one true religion. Yeah, exactly. that's amazing. Exactly. How that yeah. happens for everybody. And all that, that just, that you know, as soon as you s just s spend a little bit of time thinking about it, the whole house of cards falls apart, you know? And that's actually a big part of it, is that most people will identify as a religion which has to do with their family background and their culture and their place of birth and, you know, their geography. Uh, um, but really, it means so little to people that they haven't even taken that fraction of a second to really give it any thought because that's how meaningless it is even when they do identify as a particular religion. I think we all know people like that. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because I've had a guy, Ali Rizvi, on who mm -hmm. considers himself an atheist Muslim and that I think his book that's coming out in a couple of weeks is called The Atheist Muslim and I asked him about that well how do you decouple these things because if you don't believe in the tenets of it and he said that it, for him it was more of a cultural thing yeah. and when we were talking in the green room I was saying I, I'm an atheist but I'm culturally Jewish yeah. uh, you know that there are certain holidays that my parents celebrated that their you know their parents celebrated etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what I do, or I have bagels, or I watch Curb Your Enthusiasm. And but you you find that to be a, a bit of a whitewashing of the reality. It, right? it is, and, and you know we have so much of a stigma against being an atheist in this country, and we have so much of a positive pull to call ourselves religion, religious, that even atheists are very very loath to call themselves atheists. Like I said, ninety percent of us don't call ourselves atheists. A lot of us call ourselves Christians because we try to stay in that in that zone, even though we're. We we don't believe anymore. So you think that's just because people? It's just safer to say it, right? It's it's safer. It's more comfortable. It's also much more damaging. It's also dishonest. It also makes religion look bigger. It look makes uh, atheism look smaller. Um, the amount of people calling themselves the amount of atheists calling themselves Christians. If they would call themselves atheists, we have a different country. We don't have to change any minds. We just have to get people calling themselves atheists. And what I found out when I was writing the book is that I set out to write a defense of Jewish atheism, okay? I it was 46 years old at the time, and I set out to defend Jewish atheism with data, and I failed. Meaning That's that what you happened. were born Jewish. And I was born wanted, yeah. Jewish, and I was a cultural Jew, and I had a Jewish ethnicity and a Jewish name and a Jewish face and Jewish blood running through my veins, and it right. was all non-religious. Right. And I researched it all, and none of it's true. So that, that's what I love about this discussion, because you just said, well, I was brought up in a Catholic family, and I kept the metaphors and that stuff, kept it for a while, and then at some point got over it. And that's basically what you found out at yes. 46 for the, through writing this book. And that's, to me, 
why this conversation has to be had is because it transcends nationality, mm -hmm. it transcends color, and all of those things. All the people waking up all the time, it, it's the one common denominator. Just saying, I don't believe in some stuff that you can't prove. Uh, David probably knows the statistic on this, but it's something, uh, some ridiculous percentage of atheists who've read the Bible, <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> Christians who've read the Bible, that atheists tend to know more about the faiths than the religious people do, which is why we're atheists. Yeah, <laughs> research September 2010. There, there, I read the Bible, it was a little preachy. A little, a little preachy. Little, <laughs> little, found it a little preachy. And it's got some things that don't make quite a bit of sense. Or things that were, if they were in any other book, you'd go this I wait for the movie. <laughs> exactly, well, there's been, there's been plenty there's of, been a a few of them. So, uh, I think I sort of got this answer from you, but when did you actually have your awakening? Were you, were you 12, were you 16? When did you well, actually, I actually say, well, this here, is it? Here's the thing is what I did get, like, um, I actually went to church, uh, through much of my college years, uh, but with the full understanding that I was going to church because it was quiet. <laughs> I didn't actually go to, go to services. I went there for solace and peace wow. and to think about things. And a lot of the time that I spent there, I was writing comedy. <laughs> yeah, because it was nice and quiet and peaceful. So, so did you? And I could actually a funny focus. joke in the middle of church and break out in laughter. Uh, uh, yes, quite a few times. Yeah, uh, um, they don't take to that. Um, the guy laughing in the back writing jokes. Uh, religion, right? But I will, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say that I was never molested by a, a, any anybody in the church, and oh, it's not good scarred me you. still to this day. I have self-esteem <laughs> issues. What's wrong with me? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so so I kind of was in that nether region of. Of I don't really believe this, but I get that there's something here, or whatever. And it wasn't until I grew older, and really, uh, I saw how destructive religion was in the world, and I saw how divisive it was. And then, you know, we hit the '80s and uh, the late '70s, and we start to see the Karl Rove effect politically. That the Christian right is suddenly becoming a powerful entity in the political realm, and it became clear to me that no, I there's, there's I really have to. I really have to figure out what this is. And I, I have to give uh, credit to Penn Jillette for this, because um, uh, Penn and I were very close friends, and uh, I would do a lot of material that was essentially atheistic, but I would also incorporate a certain amount of respect mm -hmm. for people's beliefs. And it was Penn who actually helped me parse that down to like, well, why? Why do you hold respect for this? And why that? And, and this was purely a comedic exercise. Yeah. It wasn't any, you know, he wasn't trying to convince me of anything. He was sure. really going, you know, like when a joke is poorly constructed or a joke has, has you know, a, a fallacious argument in it, you know. It was that kind of a conversation. And, um, uh, and that sort of woke me up to, yeah, so let me really look at this and go, what is worthy of respect and what isn't worthy of respect? And, and where I ultimately came down on this was that all human beings are worthy of, are worthy of respect, but not all ideas are worthy of respect, mm -hmm. and not all things that people believe are worthy of respect. And um, there's a famous aphorism, I don't know, I've heard it attributed to Dawkins, but I don't know if that's the case, which is that I, I just believe in one less God than everybody else. <laughs> right, right. Because we don't believe in Thor, we don't believe in Zeus, we don't believe in Mithra, yeah. all those things. And, and so the notion of not believing in a God is pretty well entrenched in everybody. Yeah, you it's know? interesting to me, you know, going with the stand-up side of this for a second, because so many comedians are atheists, or at least are fighting the power structure, or there's so much about religion in mm -hmm. there, um, that you felt that you had to do it with a certain amount of respect, because when I see this all the time, when I'll say something about Bill Maher, or I see something on Twitter, people say, well, he's, he's this, it's this ego thing that I mentioned before, yeah. or it's too out there, it's too abrasive, it's too whatever, but he's just not showing respect to a, a, what he would say is probably a pretty shitty idea, right. the same way he would treat that any other right. shitty idea. Right. And I mean, you were I, trying to be respectful of it. I think that's kind yeah, of yeah. But that also had to do with my my immaturity, both as a, an artist and as a performer, and and in the business too, yeah. because you know. Uh, there was a time when I actually cared about not alienating people. <laughs> uh, uh, We're not at that time. Crazy, crazy time. That was time. a long time ago. Um, <laughs> so you know that mattered, and I, and and I would sort of couch it in in ways that were that where I was trying to suggest that I respect everybody, but at the same time trying to disavow everything they believed in. Yeah. And uh, you know, so that's, that's where that I mean, that's, conversation happens. Yeah. But you know, a lot of things. I've learned a lot of things about big. Philosophical issues 
through constructing jokes. Mm -hmm. When you really construct a joke with some sense of, of uh, the, I want to be truthful, I want to be honest, I want to be real, I want to be intellectually sound in this, then you really have to face a lot of things that are ultimately really philosophical and, yeah. and kind of deep. And so, well, look, almost everything that I believe about religion, George Carlin has said already. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean, every time I get... Territory. Yeah, I mean, I get into a debate about this and I just go, well, here's the link, and that's what I think about that. Well, actually, when I was a kid, one of the George Carlin bits that really, you know, kind of helped make me go recognize that this is a metaphor was the bit he used to do about being in Catholic school as a little kid and go, hey, Father, if God is all-powerful, could he make a rock so big even he can't lift it? <laughs> and I'd be like... That's a really good question. <laughs> That's a good question. It's a good joke. Yeah. It just works at every level. So, 46, you had the revelation yeah. that you you couldn't consider yourself Jewish and an yeah. atheist. But when was your sort of atheist awakening? Because you obviously had that before. And I, had still that, trying to I had that at mitigate. six years old. Six? Six years old. First grade. Take First grade. Thing. I was raised in a Jewish family, but I had uh, Christians, in my fa Christians in my universe. And so, I was one of those kids who got both Christmas and Hanukkah presence. Mm -hmm. That was the greatest thing ever. Yeah. But I was trying to figure out if Santa Claus was real. And so I devised a plan. <laughs> and I lied to my mother. I told my mother that I had asked Santa Claus for a train set. And I decided if she if I got the train set but I hadn't asked Santa Claus for it, then mom was Santa Claus. And so I'm, I remember this so clearly. It's one of those early memories that you got really down pat. Yeah. And the, right side of the back seat of my mother's blue Chrysler driving uh, down the Linway in Massachusetts toward my, toward my grandmother's house. I'm leaning over the front seat of the car and I told my mother that I asked Santa Claus for a train set. And my mother said to me, oh Dave, you're too old to believe in Santa Claus now. And I said, huh. And I released my arms from the front seat of the train set and I sat back in the seat. And by the time I was seated back in the seat, I didn't believe in Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, or God. I wouldn't even Boom. believe your parents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>